Greetings, dear friend. Welcome to Church and the Home. This is a grand occasion for us here in Dallas, Texas, to be able to talk to people around the world about this wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have quite a number here in the States who pick up our Saturday morning Church in the Home. I hope that God is blessing you where you are. If he's not, you need to get into the Word. The Word can make a difference in your understanding of what God is doing. In fact, if you're not in the Scriptures, you'll never know for sure what God is doing because you'll just be reading words that require your own ideas of interpretation. So we invite you today to this program. I'm going to be ministering on the subject of the gospel of Jesus Christ and hopeful that it will penetrate some of you and cause you to turn to the word for the hope and the help that you need in this life. The Lord's grace is ever sufficient. He never fails. He is always what he intended to be. That may seem a little strange to you because everybody that comes along with the gospel message says that God gave it to them. Everybody that comes along is going to have their own idea about how to interpret the scriptures. They're going to start out in the scriptures. Every religious group I know started out in the scriptures more or less and began to turn them more and more toward who they were and what they were doing and so forth. Our purpose in bringing you the gospel of Jesus Christ is to get you familiarized with what God is doing. I don't believe God is doing anything above what he has written in the scriptures. I think he might be adding a little here and there, but I think he's doing just exactly what he started out to do in the beginning. It is accomplishing what God intended, not to the great amount of numbers that we could give it, but it is accomplishing what God started out doing, hopeful that the people would catch on sooner or later that it's his way or no way. You understand that? You say, somebody comes to me and says, well, I just love the Lord and he loves me so much that it just doesn't matter about all a lot of things, a whole lot of things. Well, let me tell you, if you don't come to know God beyond that, you're a loser because he's bigger than you and him. He's so big that he has written in his book, primarily through Paul the Apostle, how we should live in this dispensation of time. That's what we're trying to learn. We want to know how to live in this period of time. We're looking for Jesus to come at any time. He could come tonight. He could come tomorrow, the next day. We're looking for him to come. But we cannot base our way of living on that. And so the Christ life message is a message that takes care of people's needs while they're here on earth just before the rapture. We are that people. 2,000 years have gone by since the apostle Paul preached to us about the rapture of Jesus Christ. The shout of the Lord and the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ would rise first and we who wait and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. From the time Paul made that, it's been over 2,000 years to go by. But we're still looking for Jesus because the Word never fails. The Word is not absent from knowledge and wisdom of God, and it will so come about in time. Well, that's what I'm going to be talking about today, but... Uh, we're blessed to have a good group of people here in Dallas. In fact, the best people I know in Dallas are here today. And my dear wife is here, and I want her to come and say whatever is on her heart, <laughs> if she can. <laughs> I can. <laughs> well, another two weeks have passed. Um, seems like just yesterday we were standing here doing this, but two weeks have gone by. Uh, next uh, meeting time, we will be catching a plane for South Africa, and um, Frank Blakeman is going to be here uh, in the service. He's he's visiting Dallas, and so we're going to have him handle the service and bring you a message. So be sure to tune in. You'll find out there's more people around this world uh, talking about this message than just Warren and Robbie. Um, it'll do your heart good to join us 
uh, October 18th. Pray for us as we make this trip. I'm not real excited about the plane trip. I'm excited about being with the people and in the meetings, but um, I'm just real not crazy about getting on those airplanes right now. <laughs> anyway, um, today is Peggy Cray Cruz's uh, 99th birthday. And we've known Peggy since goodness. She was a young chick. She was, uh, she did secretarial work for us, even though she lived in Conroe, Texas. Um, she handled our correspondence and uh, just did a superb job. And uh, here, little Peggy, goodness, I don't know if she's even five feet tall, uh, turns 99 today. And we just want to tell Peggy and her family how much we love Peggy and appreciate her life and her service to the Lord and to this fellowship. We have members in this body who are going through really severe times right now. Um, we pray for them. Uh, we, we don't uh, probably do the big grandiose thing that we should do like your mega churches do, but we sure hold them up before the Lord in prayer. A um, number of ladies going through the cancer issue facing real tough decisions, and boy do my, does my heart go out to them. So I know there are those of you around the world that have your, your prayer requests, you have your special needs, you're going through trials and hard places now that only Christ can make a difference. I talked to Mark Asante on the phone, or we both did, uh, last evening, and he just returned from Ghana where he visited his uh, family. <laughs> And he met such uh, big needs while he was there um, among his family and Christian brothers and sisters. So just remember, um, he's in you. Christ the healer is in you. That's what I relied on and am still relying on. You know, you can seek outside sources and help and, and understanding and, um, and all. But nothing takes the place from the wisdom that comes from this Christ who lives in us. And I think we forget that. I, I really think we find ourselves um, acting like that's not enough. Just Christ in me. I know the believers in China and in Russia, they have to rely strictly on the Christ in them. They don't have a church building. They don't have a congregation. They can't come to Christ Life Fellowship in Dallas. But they rely on the Christ who is in them. That's not a flippant thing. That's not something to take for granted. You might find yourself in a dark, lonely place where that really becomes a reality to you. It has me. Um, and, and it is real. It's not a religious cliche. It's not something we just toss around to make each other feel good. It is a reality. So just want to encourage you uh, in our audience that uh, he's your source. I mentioned that last meeting. He is your source. Um, and the more you turn to him and the more you give your mind to him, the more you hear and draw from that wisdom in the decisions you make. Boy, if you turn to the, the wisdom that is earthly, this, this earthly wisdom, trying to figure it out, scratching your head, going over it and over it and over it and over it again, trying to find out which route do I go? What do I do? What decisions do I make? That's the, that's the earthly wisdom. That's you. That's you trying to make your own way. And I know there have been times in past where I've turned things over to the Father only to find myself trying to work them out in, a, in my way, thinking that what I could do could really speed things up or really, really help in the case. And you, you just actually take them back out of the Father's hands when you do that. Um, he will give you the wisdom and you will know it's right in your choices and in your decisions you have to make. And that pertains to everything in life, uh, bar none whether it be your marriage, your finances, your education, um, raising your children, your sickness uh, it, uh, that you're suffering. So um, that's my word 
for you today. Um, I think that those of you out there think that Warren and Robbie are, are the ministry here. We're absolutely not. Warren and I could not make it if it were just the two of us. We have a pretty grand fellowship here in Dallas, Texas. And uh, some of them travel a lot of miles to get here. It's on a Saturday. It's not convenient all the time. So it has to be made a priority in order to do it, that this is important. Important that we join together and, and be here. Um, so the Father has a way of getting this message out to you and to those that you'd like to invite to this message. I'd like uh, Howard to come up. I want to introduce Howard to you. Uh, he, come on up, Howard. I want to show you just a little bit of our work crew. And you know, I've always said that the middle name for Christ Life Believers has to be Elastic. Because this, this is, this is uh, Howard Elastic Goss. Because you ha we have to really be flexible. We ha we're stretched. Sometimes Howard is put on a job and all of a sudden Robbie or Warren pulls him to do something that's really important for the moment. And, and Howard is one who really likes to stick with one job so he gets that one job done. And this guy is the same way. Well, I do too, except, um, <laughs> except th uh, t to keep 20 or 30 things moving, sometimes you have to, to do that. Uh, Wayne, could you come up please? Yes, you are. I'll come back and get you. Wanda, come on up. I want you, I want you all to see a little bit of our work crew here that uh, makes it possible for us to do our daily, weekly, monthly things here. Uh, this is Wanda Elastic Franklin. <laughs> she just pitches in wherever there's a need. Um, whether it's, um, I think she works on cars and she paints and she does repair jobs and she works in the kitchen and uh, fix grandfather clock. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she works in the office, in the mail room. Um, she's just, and she's always cheerful. I, you know, I really like cheerful people. If they're going to work, I like, <laughs> I like cheerful people, and she is. Um, Wayne's back there, and uh, Wayne, come on. Everybody out here knows you. They know what you look like, even in your shorts. <laughs> I'm certainly not Anyway, he was. <laughs> they won't see below he was. Leg. He was out on the uh, property yesterday, all day yesterday. He keeps things around here really looking nice and uh, grooming, grooming the, the property, and he helps keep motors running, the tractors, and the equipment that we have here. And he does a lot of other uh, odd jobs too. And his name is Wayne Elastic Bone Cutter. <laughs> so, because uh, he, he does have to be flexible. So, just think about your name, whatever your first name is. Put that word elastic in there, and then that's your new middle name. So, um, and we, we, have, we have others around here that pitch in whenever they're called. Um, Tim is, is our cameraman. He does, he, he does just all sorts of things to. Uh, keep this message going out from Dallas. Y'all wouldn't be getting it if it weren't for Tim. And he has a family. He holds down other jobs. And he's here. He, he sets this as a priority. And uh, he's lacked some equipment that would really help make his job easier. And hopefully and prayerfully, we're going to be able to remedy that soon. And uh, that way, those of you who, who do not get the message live, like we're doing today, you can go on the recorded message and get it um, real soon, hopefully the very same day. Right now he has to take a lot of time to process that. But um, we just want to let you know that this is not, this is Warren Elastic Litzman and I'm Robbie Elastic Litzman. So <laughs> the Lord has added um, uh, Curtis and Jenny uh, to, our, to our group. Uh, workers and they are workers they just pitch in wherever they see a need and you know your prayers this body prays for us I know when we get on the plane mm -hmm. I know the prayers of this body and you all out there are with us I don't want to forget Bill Cal um, Bill has been with us for eons <laughs> for, a for ages at least 
I remember Bill way, way, way back. Um, he does so many things. Uh, he's, he's our computer whiz, our, our, our professor in computers. And so whenever we have a need with the machinery or, or just anything, we, we turn to Bill. And uh, among his other problems and issues with, that he's had physically, he has always helped carry the load here. And so his name is Bill Elastic Cows. <laughs> so um, anyway, I could just name names of, of so many of you here who help and who participate in these, in these meetings. Chris Lara has been with us for ages. <laughs> So um, I want to thank this group here. And for your financial support, we would not be making this trip if so, so many of you had not pitched in and sent money in to help us purchase our tickets and uh, keep us going. Um, uh, there are churches that have big programs, big buildings, big music, a lot of big things. And we don't have those things. We're not showy. And, but I'll tell you what. There's not very many places that send the gospel out as we do in this small body of people. And one of the reasons is because we have people like this who they're not paid, they're not on a paid salary, they hold jobs down, they do their work, and they pitch in to, to take care of the needs of this body as well. So just want to let you see our family, a part of them. We got one back there who's, his name is Bone Cutter, so you can see why he's still sitting back there on the seat. Anyway, thank you guys. You thank you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and some of you are missing Nora Gregory's uh, songs on these, uh, on these live meetings. We've just got to get the sound and the, we, we've got issues that we're trying to work out with Nora. It's not on his part, because he would get up here no matter what, but he deserves, he deserves to be presented <laughs> in a way that's, uh, that's, that's uh, complimentary. So he'll be back on soon. Our website was supposed to have been launched Thursday. I was told in a few hours it's going to be on. That was mid-morning Thursday. A few hours it's going to be launched. Boy, I, I let some people know. I said, get ready, get ready. Well, it didn't get launched Thursday, so I fussed about it Friday. <laughs> um, so I'm looking for Monday. <laughs> you know, the world is in this tomorrow, tomorrow. <laughs> we'll do it tomorrow. But uh, <clears throat> be patient with us as you, are, as you have been. Uh, it's going to be a great uh, tool. And uh, we're just appreciative for the company that's, that's uh, working on this and for those who have uh, made this possible for, to have this new website. So thank you so much. Love and hugs. Amen. I'd like to remind you that we're getting close to our dates on uh, Pine Cove. If you haven't made your reservation, please do it. Uh, I hold right in my hand here the, the papers for registration, and if you would, make, make sure you can do that before you leave here today. God will bless you for it. Isn't it wonderful to know him in whom to know is life eternal? That's a big thing, you know. Somebody says, I just need more of Jesus. You get more of Jesus, you enter into eternal relationship. That's a very difficult point to come to, the eternal relationship. That means that you don't care what happens to you here and now or tomorrow or 10 years from now. You're eternal in God's plan. So much for that. Take your Bible, if you will. And turn to Romans chapter 1, powerful verse of Scripture. Romans 1 and 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it, now circle that it. When I first read this verse many years ago, <coughs> I was kind of set back. Because I thought of the way everybody preached the gospel a little bit different. How could that be a single it? 
But in time, I saw that if you follow Paul's directions and teachings, you'll see that there's only one gospel to him. There's only one word from God for him. So that word it doesn't mean that just anybody that preaches is an it. It is only those who are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God. The power of God. And that bothered me too, because I always felt like the power of God was something Christ gave you, something that you prayed for, fasted and prayed for, that you'd have that power. But the facts are, the power of God is in the gospel. That's what Paul says here. It's a gospel thing. It has to do with the message he received from Jesus Christ. It has to do with uh, this thing we call revelation. All of this was revealed to him. The words of his gospel was revealed to him. The ideas behind his words was revealed to him by Jesus Christ. Now, all men can do today is to take what Paul said and like it or lump it. And that's what I present to you today, that you cannot make an exchange for the gospel of Jesus Christ that came right from the lips of Jesus from his father to the apostle Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. It has come to me this week that there are only two races of people on this earth that need the gospel. We used to say three, and there is three, because you don't want to leave out the new creation race. Uh, they still need the gospel. Many who are loudly proclaiming that don't realize how much they still need the word because you, you can't move after you get a hold of the word. Let me tell you this about the scriptures. Once they take hold of you, there's no end to your learning what is in the word. You never come to the place where you say, well, I know that. I have had hundreds of people tell me in my last 40 two years of preaching, who have said, I know all that stuff you're preaching. I learned that long time ago. Well, they're sure smarter than I am, and that's not a, that's not a big statement. That I may not be as smart as them, but I am smart about one thing, and that is that the Word of God never stops working. He doesn't have to change the words. He merely changes the truth of the words by the event of life that you're in. That's God's plan. That's God's purpose. That's where God works the best. And so I've decided today to talk to you right out of the scriptures. Everybody got a Bible? Take your Bible and turn to chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. I have picked out, I don't know, six or seven important points that have to do with the gospel. Some of them we seldom speak of. But it shows you the power of the gospel in some of these words in 1 Corinthians. We begin with verse 4 that says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given me by Jesus Christ. Now, let's begin right. There are plenty of people who have heard a word from the Lord, but there has never been another human being who has received the gospel from Jesus Christ personally. Now, why do I say that? Because everybody thinks, well, I have a special place with the Lord. I come to know these things through years of study, through seminary, and through pastoring, I learned a lot of things, and that's what I talk about and teach. Well, let's get it in our mind that we study the word that was given to one man named the Apostle Paul. He didn't give 
the gospel to anybody else. He didn't give it to another. Not even Peter received this gospel. He receives some light from it. He says some things that are good, but he didn't get the gospel for this dispensation of time. Peter was old line. He probably didn't believe in dispensations. There, there's a good percentage of people today who don't believe in dispensations. But that's the way you single out Paul. Paul is the apostle for a distinctive dispensation. You understand that? We're in that dispensation. This is a dispensation of grace, started at the cross, ends at the rapture. This is a dispensation that needed a new and a different message. Now that has to be incorporated in the gospel. You can't just be like most preachers and get up and say, well, I'm preaching the whole word of God. I'm just taking everything God said on this subject and passing it on to you. That isn't the way it was. It was that Jesus Christ from his Father had received a final gospel. No one else can come up with a better, greater gospel. No one else can say <clears throat> that we've been given some part of that gospel. That's not the way it worked. That's not the way it is. And so in this very verse, he is able to say, For the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ... Here's a man that took himself out. He took himself out of this glorious plan of God. He can take no credit for it. He has no background for this gospel. He was a rabbi. He has no inspiration given to him that was his alone. His inspiration comes from Christ himself. And that's important because he was going to open up a brand new gospel and the people who heard it would be in the same place he was. They wouldn't know a whole lot. They wouldn't have a big background. They wouldn't be somebody. They would be just ordinary people who would come into what Jesus Christ said. So our very first point here and our first thought about what is taking place here is in the fact that this gospel by grace has been given to each of us by Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ. Why would anybody want to change it? Why would anybody think that they've got a better understanding of it than what's written in this book? Why would people think that? Well, I have found that some people grow in the Lord. Christ is in them, and they grow into his full stature. He has full stature. They're growing into him, into him. I can't understand how people can think that they know more than God intended. He gave us what we should know. We'll get further into this as we go through this chapter. Verse 5 that in everything you are enriched by him, who? Jesus Christ. You are enriched by Jesus Christ. You didn't make the right move. You're enriched by Jesus Christ. You didn't bring your healing. You're enriched by Jesus Christ. You didn't make possible your job. You're enriched by Jesus Christ. Look at the language here. I'm trying to get you, let Paul get out of the middle, and you get out of the middle, and take these words as they are written, as they are. That in everything we are enriched by him. What does that mean? That means there's not any subject, there's not any place you're involved with in your life that Jesus Christ doesn't fit. He doesn't fit. A fellow told me not long ago, he said, I'm going to a meeting, and he said, I probably won't be able to talk about Jesus Christ. He just doesn't fit with this group of people. And I thought, yes. 
There are many people that don't fit with him. But we must, we must talk about him. We got a new crisis going on in our world right now. A crisis of disease. I think it's strange that the most religious city in the United States, they sent folks that already had the disease. <laughs> much as I don't like it, much as I don't think it was wise, much as I wish that it kept it over there where it belongs. But they were sent here. They got here one way or another. One fellow went through three different countries on the airline changing planes so that he could get to America and they not know who he was. That he had the disease. A world in great need that doesn't know what to do with themselves. There are going to be new religions, new ideas, new programs that come along in the future that's going to grip thousands of people. But it's only for the moment. I look back now at some of the things that's happened right here in America where somebody thought, well, this is a cure-all disease. This is the right place to go to church, the only place. And most of those places have folded up. Paul doesn't try to sell this message by PR work. He's not going to talk to the saints. But trying to sell them something. He's going to say it right out of his heart as he gets it from Jesus Christ. That in everything you be enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Oh, i got to stop there. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever had it confirmed in you that the message of Jesus Christ is the right message? I wouldn't want to embarrass you, but uh, I'm tempted to say everybody that has gone to some other church before you found the Christ life, raise your hand. I won't do that. Because that includes every one of us here. We all were somewhere else when this gospel came to us. We were doing something else. We were involved in something else. But we found Jesus. Did the other place have Jesus? Yep. They had bits, pieces, and parts of Christ. They had good things to say about Jesus. They had good works from Jesus to them. They were healed. They were transformed. They were taken care of by our Lord. But all of that didn't mean that they knew the Jesus that lived in them. You understand the difference I'm making there? That was a Jesus you called upon. That was a Jesus you fasted and prayed that he'd come and help you. That was a Jesus who you thought by finding certain scriptures would never fail you. But you know what? That was not the right Jesus. That's not what Paul's message is all about. That's not what this gospel is all about. He's talking about Jesus in another form. He's talking about the Christ that was given to us, Christ's spirit, the real Christ. You understand something that what you are by spirit is the real you. That's, that's who you are is by your spirit. That's why the verse of scripture Paul gives us about Christ coming into somebody's life. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. What he does, he cuts out Anything that might be contrary to Jesus Christ. Contrary to Jesus Christ. 
That's what this gospel is all about. That's what he's trying to say. And so, in all knowledge, if all knowledge doesn't bring you to the Christ who lives in you, you're a failure at looking for it, and you'll be a failure in knowing Christ. That's what makes our message so different. Christ lives in us. He can talk to us from that position. He moves in our life from that position. That's what you and I have got to get fixed in us so that we have a message for this world like Paul did. He had a message for all Christianity because he knew that Christ lived in him. Go on to the sixth verse. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you came behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. One important thing I say about this verse. First, it must be confirmed in you, this message. You need to read and study this message until you willingly get rid of all other messages, all other ideas, all other things. You must be willing to make that sacrifice. And then he says that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I grew up in a group of people who said in most every message, have you waited on God for your gift? Now, there are two kinds of gifts. One kind is the gift that comes from a human being who has been created by God with a special touch in them. That's a very gifted person. That's a pianist that becomes above and beyond most other piano players, a gift given to them, a singer whose voice is different than most people's. An artist that is able to paint. I could go on and on. Everyone must have a confirmation from the Lord concerning their gift. Why? He created everybody was some kind of touch from God in their creation, and that composes the gift. I preached most of my life before I ever had an idea about what my gift was. I tried many things in my life, hoping I could make them successful. But it wasn't until I was willing to sit like this and talk to hundreds and thousands of people around the world about this Savior of ours, that I had an inkling of what my gift was. That's my creation gift. That's not something I brought about. That's not something that come with me out of college. That's not something that come to me over years of preaching and teaching. I finally came to the place, and I was satisfied. And I had the greatest moment of satisfaction I've had was when it dawned upon me that me sitting like this talking to people about Jesus was my gift. Now, that may not seem big to you, but it was to me. You're still probably waiting, where is your gift? But uh, it was to me. It was to me. It was confirmed in me. And Jesus Christ was the one who did that. Jesus Christ. That's my point number one. Let me go on to my next point, up in the 10th verse. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 
We can never have a clear-cut message from the Christ life until everyone who gives it says the same thing. I guess today, more than ever before, there are voices coming alive with some part of the Christ ministry in believers. It's not hard to find them. You'll find them on television saying something every once in a while. There's two or three of them that have written books, and they're doing the best they can. But the real facts are they're not speaking the same thing that's going to stir this world. People often ask me, why do you just stick with the Apostle Paul? Because I believe what he says. I believe what he says. And I don't want to know what Nehemiah said. I don't want to know what Daniel said. I don't want to know what Isaiah said. Not that they were not great in their moment and to the people they were to talk to and themselves receiving something special from God. But that was in their day. In my day, I needed to have something too. And I found it in Paul's message. Because when I began to sense that I had Christ living in me, who else could talk about that? Peter doesn't talk about it. James doesn't talk about it. Only other help he had was 30 years later, the apostle John talked about it. That didn't help the writing of these scriptures we live in now. But they were, that was good. Somebody come along as a believer. But you see, you got to find out that your message is no good unless we all speak the same thing. I've said this most every place I've ever had a class because I had people sitting there that went to any number of different churches, believed any number of different things, had no idea that there was a one single gospel that God could use to reach this world. That's probably the hardest thing some old time believers have and is the reason why they have never joined with us, at least where I've been, they never joined with me. Because for them to give up what they believe and what they've been taught by the Lord that is non-dispensational, doesn't fit in our dispensation, wasn't given to many of them for that purpose. They just carry on with what they've always learned. They, they carry on with the kind of truth that uh, we call our grandfather truth. Grandfather had it and father had it and I, now I have it. No, you've got to get the one single truth in your understanding. That's why God can't use a lot of people, even in our work. They don't speak the same thing. And I had no part of that. I didn't write this verse, this 10th, what is it? This 10th verse. I didn't write that. I've never said to people that you've got to agree with me on every point. But I have said to them that we do have to agree with everything that's in this gospel that Paul gave us. I can't background on it. That's a part of this gospel. Let me tell you how God must look at this. My idea. When he brought Jesus back from earth to heaven, he began to set up this final gospel. He was going to make it known. That must have been a hard thing for he and Jesus to work out because they had so many souls that were so dedicated to what God had done like in the Old Testament. But he said, we've got to strike that out. That's not there anymore. Law's not there anymore. Died at the cross. He went through one thing after another and struck them out. Why? Because they didn't fit the new gospel. Nobody recognized that any more than the Apostle Paul. And when he received his 
among his several revelations this idea that if everybody speaks something a little differently, if they don't come to grasp with what Paul says in his word, which I think are words that are easily understood. I've never had any problem understanding all of Paul's words. I do have a problem with some of them, and I put them on a shelf. But God at that time thought, unless I can get a gospel that every man speaks, then I won't have the proper representatives of Jesus Christ. For here's the point. He took Christ out of this world who might have been a great world changer and turned the responsibility over to the born-again believer. We are to do the work of Christ. We are to tell the world what the gospel is. We are responsible to the gospel that I claim comes in the final dispensation for us. Be one following us, but I hope none of you nor I will be here at that time. I believe in a rapture. But God took Christ out of this world and turn the responsibility over to the believer. We are ambassadors for Christ. We, with Christ in us, handle the problems, the trials, the heartaches of humanity. We heal the sick through the Christ that is in us. It was a whole different plan. It was a whole different gospel. There wasn't one thing out of the Old Testament that Paul takes to explain himself. There's not one thing out of the early, early New Testament church that Paul puts in his thinking because it doesn't come from Christ. It isn't what the revelation of Jesus Christ is all about. So that's why Paul teaches us to separate soul and spirit. Separate, divide, and stick with what it is God has given me. And you say that's an awfully braggatocious man. It appears that way, but it isn't. He is the only one God chose to bring the final gospel. And if, we know, if we're not pure to it, like there are many things throughout the teachings of Paul that I haven't come to knowledge with or at least haven't come to a place to where I'm ready to talk about them. But I've talked to the Lord about them and I put them, as I say, on a shelf and I'm willing to leave them there because I don't want to to speak something different than what Paul speaks. It bothers me when people say, well, I've been sick, but I've trusted the Lord. I've just spent a, a lot of time back in the Old Testament trusting the Lord. And I didn't say it, but I thought, well, that must be awful for Christ who lives in you to hear because it isn't the same gospel. It isn't the same program. Christ in human beings is something new and different and hard for them to take and hard for them to let loose of what they have been to be who they're supposed to be. So he says here in this verse that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Read on. For it hath been declared unto you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of clothes, that they are contentions among you. I have run into this a number of times. I've had people who would really like to have this message but they've got to add to it everything they know. 
I'm sure there's some of you sitting in this audience here right now who got fed up with that in some church building. That they did pretty good. They were coming right along. But if they were reading 1 Corinthians, they'd like to dismiss verse 10. And they did. They talked around it, jumped over it, or did something with it. Because they weren't ready. They had rather create a division and say, I've been trying to tell you folks what the, I think the Bible says. I don't care what somebody thinks. I want to stick with what it is that binds us together, that makes us one. And so he says, you'll be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For Verse 11, for it hath been declared among you that there are those in Chloe's house. Verse 12, now I say that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. The next line says, is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? You can divide him, but he's not divided. You can say that we're of Christ uh, under the name of Mormon. They'll tell you that. Jehovah Witnesses will say, we're of Christ. But we've got our own understanding. I don't care if you say you're of Christ and somebody says, what is your understanding? You look them in the eye and say right back to them, Christ. The Christ that the Apostle Paul said lived in us, lives in me. That's it. I may say it better. I may say it differently. But I must say it according to the word. That's the gospel. You can't keep on saying in your lifetime that I'm of somebody else. You can't keep on saying that I, I believe all Christians are all right. That's not why you have received Christ as your life. Because God intending by publishing Christ in you was that you would be a part of those who take over the evangelization Jesus spoke of it in words when he was here that you'll do greater things than I've done because I'm going to the Father. That was a plan of God. That was something that was in their mind that we would evangelize the world. And we are doing it. But not with the same gospel. Not with the same gospel. Let's move on. Now I say that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, Paulus, Cephas, Christ. Is Christ divided? Now here is the reason why I say these words. The next line. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Two things. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Every once in a while, I've had somebody to come to me and say, you just put too much of a load on Paul. It's almost like you worship Paul. There's not an iota in me that worships Paul. But there is in my simple brain an understanding that he alone has the message. Get that settled in your mind. Stop going all over the Bible looking for something that's going to make a difference in your life. Spend time in Paul's epistles. Spend time knowing 
man to whom God gave the responsibility in the beginning. Verse 15 says, Lest any should say that I had baptized in my name, my own name. And he goes into a, a history here of his life in baptizing people. He says, And I baptized also the household of Stenephius, and besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For, Christmas sent, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of non effect. Mark those heavy. You won't want to receive that right off. Because the greatest works of God I know in this country or around the world still preach water baptism. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name, I did baptize in Ephesus. But I stopped baptizing, lest the cross of Christ should be made of non effect. I've lived long enough to say that there are very few people living who have baptized more than I. When I had the college, I was always baptizing a student. When I was an evangelist, I was called upon again and again to baptize somebody, and I did. But notice what he says here. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect. What is the difference between me baptizing somebody and me not baptizing somebody? Because it is me. That has been made a spiritual act, that something deep of the Spirit will take place. And I have oftentimes looked for it when I baptize somebody. I've had a few people to come up out of the water shouting. And that was a better display than most of them. Most of them come up wet and a little scared. <laughs> I understand why Paul says this. Why he says in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, and unto us which are saved it is the power of God. That's a part of the gospel we believe in. Well, somebody says, let's just throw that part out because everybody's baptizing today, and there was John the Baptist, and even Jesus was baptized but none of them according to the final gospel. None of them. Let's move on. Preaching of the cross is for them that perish. For it is written, verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. What is he saying here? God says to him, It is so written. It is so written in the message we have. That human wisdom is not needed for any part of the plan of God. 
Now, wisdom's a big thing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, Corinthians could be called the wisdom chapter because it's just got all kinds of uses of wisdom in it, teaching in it. But the wisdom of the wise without Christ and his knowledge comes to nothing, comes to nothing. Why? Something I always knew about water baptism when I did it is that this is not a real spiritual thing because he's using me to do it. So it wasn't a deep spiritual thing. There is in the one baptism that Paul calls for the fact that the Holy Spirit baptized people into Christ. Now that's a spiritual baptism. That's not baptizing somebody because that's a final confirmation that I'm going to get them as church members. And they can't become a church member until I baptize them. Did you know that? You say, well, I'm already baptized, but I like to go to this church. Sooner or later, they're going to ask you to be baptized again. Because your old baptism won't stand. As you know, I'm often talking about a fellow who tells me he had 10 different water baptisms, and he said, I could see no difference in any of them. I don't mean to make light of it, because that's a big thing in religion today. But I'm listening to what Paul has to say. I believe what he has to say is important enough for us to talk about it sometime. Verse 21 says, For after that is the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now get this. That line, that verse is very important. It's important because if God is going to take Christ out of this work, who spoke as no other man ever spoke, who taught as no other man ever taught, who healed the sick, cast out devils, raised the dead, fed the multitudes, if God's going to take his son out of this world, and that's the end of his ministry here, then it better be something important to the people I rely upon to carry on his work. We're just a little group of people. But it's important that you and I, because God has given us a message and because our message has gone worldwide and because there are many people around the world who so believe it. You and I here at the focal point have a responsibility to stick with this word, to obey this word, not to argue over it, but to catch what it is Paul says. Notice, he said the wisdom of God will not fail, but the wisdom in this world will fail. Like Verse 22 says, For the Jews require sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. That's the only two races left on this earth that God's dealing with, the Jew and the Gentiles. That's the people God's dealing with. How are we going to reach them? How are we going to carry forth in this world what God's plan is for us? Look at verse 23. It says, but, I don't have water baptism. I'm not claiming to be a 
man of wisdom. I'm trusting God. He's listed all the things that he is. He says, but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. If anybody in the Christ life ever preaches a message without it being based on the crucifixion of Christ and themselves, they have failed to bring the true gospel. Always remember Romans 16.25 to him that is of the power to establish you according to my gospel. There you are, Paul speaking. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation according to the revelation of the mystery <coughs> which was kept secret since the world began. If anybody attempts to talk and to preach without that, without that knowledge, without that understanding, they're not following Christ because the Christ they are to follow, the only Christ they are to follow, the only writer who wrote after Jesus was taken back is the Apostle Paul. I think their strength and power in doing what he said. Verse 24 says, For them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Nationality, ethnicity, doesn't matter in God's plan. For God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That's how he let us in. He knew we were not the smartest. We were not the wise. We were not the most important. But he said God has chosen apparently what looked like the foolish things, foolish people in this world, to confound the wise. I have been blessed many times in my ministry where somebody come to me and said, well, I never heard that before. I never knew that was in the Bible. Confounded. Verse 25 says, and based things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen you. He chose you. You're taking the place of Jesus Christ on this earth. Our mission is to get the crucified Christ known. That's what this previous verse said. Our mission as believers, is to get the crucified Christ known and you a part of that crucifixion. Somebody told me this past week that he's ready to make a witness to somebody. And what should I do first? I said, it's very simple. Don't go telling them what they need to do. First, tell them that when Jesus died on the cross, you died with him that when he was crucified, you were crucified with him. If you don't say those things, you're just words. It's just words. And then you come to the point to, when you get through telling about yourself and what happened to you at the cross, you can say to that friend, dear friend, when he died, he died for whosoever believeth. He didn't just die for a little handful of us. He died for the whole wide world. Everybody that was in it. And that includes you. You see, you laid a defining foundation. And that's necessary. 
That's necessary. So, we can carry on now. Verse 28 says, In base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen you, and things which are not to bring forth, things which are not to bring forth things that are. That's what you'll do. Don't testify of yourself first. Make that secondary. Talk about your crucifixion. Talk about his crucifixion. He did that for every soul, every person. Let's make it, let's make it real. Last verses in this first chapter says, third, verse 30, but of him are you in Christ Jesus. There he is, right back to the single point. Christ lives in us. Who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption? Who has made that? The Christ that lives in us. That's not a gift to people who have never had a revelation of Jesus Christ. But to those who have a, a revelation of Jesus Christ, they have redemption. Sanctification, wisdom, knowledge. Who's Christ? Am I willing to give up me for him? He didn't give me wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. He is that. And it's mine because he's my life. That's the answer. No said. I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you. In your life and all that you do. I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in me, I see Jesus in me, in my life and all that I do, I see Jesus in me.